Hi everyone, this is the Crime Cafe, where we talk crime, suspense, and thrills. And uh, as a matter of fact, today we're going to talk a little bit of sci-fi, because our guest is Jim Winter, who formerly wrote as Jim Winter in the crime fiction genre, but is now writing as T.S. Hoddle in sci-fi. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, I just want to say that uh, the Crime Fact Cafe is offering a 99 cent deal. Uh, for 99 cents, if you go to crimecafe.net, you can get a collection of seven novels and three short stories um, contributed by all the authors who are uh, going to be guests on the Crime Cafe. And that includes uh, T.S. Hoddle. Uh, so I hope that you'll go over to crimecafe.net and check it out. Uh, so with that, let's turn things over to uh, T.S. Hoddle, who goes by Tom now. I have to get used to that instead of Jim. And as you can see, he's sitting in what he calls the dungeon. Yes, yes. Uh, when my wife and I got married, we decided we're going to live at her house, and I got exiled down here. <laughs> but, uh, my wife didn't want us to move the bedroom down here, and we didn't want to kick my stepson down here, so, you know, this became my office. Ah. Yeah. Well, for those of you who are listening to this by podcast, you can't see his office, but it's it looks really dark from where I'm sitting. <laughs> <laughs> and he calls I need some it lamps. Um, in any case, um, how is Cleveland these days? I'm not sure. I live in Cincinnati. I'm oh, there. Okay. Yeah, I've lived there for, um, oh, God, 24 years now. Wow. Time flies. And uh, I used to like to say I moved to Cincinnati to uh, be with the love of my life, and then in 2008 I met her. You know, 1991 to 2008, yeah, you know, you want to be thorough. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that was kind of the genesis of the uh, the Kepler series was I was a little bit homesick. I was like, I miss Cleveland, and I started writing about Cleveland PI. And uh, it was kind of cool because I got to go back home and do research. And uh, obviously that's paid off from some of the feedback I've gotten. Yes, I was going to say, um, Cleveland is sort of imbued heavily in your work. Um, do you consider it like a character, the way other writers write about other cities? I do. I've always considered the setting, especially in uh, the crime genre, kind of a character. Um, you know, it's like if you read 87th Precinct, uh, Isola and the surrounding boroughs, they're clearly based on New York City. I mean, they even have almost identical histories, but it's its own city. Hmm. It's, it's, it's its own city. You could not put those characters in New York City and have the stories be the same because the real world history of New York City would just intrude on it. Uh, it would be very interesting, but it would not be the same 87th Precinct. What is, it, <clears throat> what is it about Nick Kepler that is particularly Cleveland like? How do you express the city Cleveland through Nick Kepler's character? He's a bit politically incorrect on some of his humor, but it's all very good natured. I grew up in a city where you told a lot of Polish jokes because you knew a lot of Polish kids and they were the ones telling you that. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> Making fun of Uncle Spash getting off the boat is what they were doing. Um, but just that, and there was the beer drinking. If you, go to, if you go to any of the Steel Belt cities, the old Steel Belt cities like Cleveland or Detroit or Pittsburgh, uh, a lot of cheap, watery beer. We like our underdog teams. If we have the one team that's doing really well, like you know the Brown, the original Browns were, and the Steelers with the Steel Curtain. Uh, you get very loyal to that, or you, you know, they're your arch nemesis. Uh, but Steelers right, right where he was a lot of fun back in the day. <laughs> and uh, Nick is very much a product of that. His ethnicity is kind of a product of that too. He's like, he's kind of a mud. He's German. He's Polish. He's Jewish. Uh, a little bit of Cherokee thrown in, but that's kind of from my, you know, my mom's side of the family had a little bit of Cherokee there from Kentucky. And uh, 
just made for an interesting mix. And that was, that was, that was the type of people I grew up around. They seem, uh, he seems quintessentially Midwestern and uh, perhaps quintessentially American in that sense, that he's a mixture of backgrounds. Yeah, it's, um, I think if you, you can see some of the characters, um, he's not quite as, um, I don't think he has as strong a political beliefs as say maybe Amos Walker in Detroit, but he's got that same background, that whole working class attitude. Uh, doesn't like seeing the big guys push little people around. Uh, I think he'd be very home, very at home in Chicago. And at one point, I was toying with uh, moving him to Chicago for a story, where he was going to be kind of the uh, consultant on a cheaters type. TV program and the host gets killed and he ends up being doubling as the host and the guy solving the crime as well. Hmm. Uh, who knows? With the way I ended the series, that uh, you know, if I ever, if he ever comes back and starts whispering in my ear, maybe that's what will happen. So, well, he went to Chicago. He went to New Orleans and then he went to Chicago. Can you talk a little bit about the series for people who aren't as familiar with it as I am? Um, how do sure, you see sure. the uh, Nick Kepler arc in your series going? I saw him, well, first of all, I wanted somebody representative of Cleveland. Um, I think at that point, Les Roberts' series was um, for Mylon Yakovich, which was based in Cleveland, as the best known detective from Cleveland, was getting eased out of its uh, publishing deal with St. Martin's. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I want to come up with my own. And what I did was I had him prowling around neighborhoods and suburbs that I used to hang out in. Uh, the building where he had his office is actually, I altered the address somewhat, but there really is an insurance company on St. Clair Avenue across the street from the Marriott. Huh. Um, and what I wanted to do is I just wanted to put pieces of things that I had read before together and kind of mix them up. Uh, his working arrangement at the beginning of the series is um, was kind of inspired by Sue Grafton. Uh, he, she had Kinsey working out of an insurance company office. I thought, oh, I'll do one better. I'll work out of, have him work out of the headquarters. And at the time, I worked for an insurance company, which is ironic because I am interviewing for a software shop with the same insurance company this week. Oh, my so, goodness. Yes. So that's where you get your knowledge of insurance, I take it? Uh, yeah, when you work with insurance people, they're more than like, hey, tell me about your job. And insurance people love to tell you about their job because most people are like, insurance looks boring. I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want to talk to the accountants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I bet you get some interesting stories, huh? Yeah. And then what happened was um, when I started to write the second novel, um, the character of Elaine started getting a little more insistent and wanting you know, well, yeah, that character is just says, I want to be more involved. And I knew that they kind of had a mutual crush, but I figured it was just like something like you have that one coworker that, you know, you just kind of click with. It's like your work spouse, you know. And the, over the course of secondhand goods, Nick gets into a situation where he's not even sure he's going to be alive within, you know, 12 hours, let alone 24, and that is when Nick and Elaine become Nick and Elaine, not Elaine who works with the insurance company, throws some secretarial help when he needs it. Uh, it just it went to a whole new level, and then that went into bad religion, where they kind of had to figure out what that whole thing meant, um, which was interesting. And in bad religion, if you grew up in Cleveland and Akron, Pittsburgh, that whole corridor there on I-76, uh, you could not swing a dead cat without hitting a televangelist. <laughs> I thought, i got to do something with this. Wow. Even though we moved into the, the age of, you know, mega churches and big political, you know, evangelists, I wanted to kind of throw back to the guy with bad hair. And uh, that was what I got Nick involved in. I'm sorry, I didn't quite pick up all of what you just said. <laughs> okay, let me back up. 
Um, when I started on Bad Religion, I kind of wanted to do a throwback to that classic. Like, uh, if you remember from the 80s, you had, like, Jim Baker and Jimmy Swagger. And exactly. All the ones got taken down. Um, there were a few that didn't get caught with, you know, their hand in the cookie jar or other things in other places. And I wanted this guy to be like, you know, he meant well, but he's more interested in being the big kahuna. And so I built this whole backstory around him. Originally, I wanted him to be kind of this really evil guy. And really, you just had to kind of stand back and laugh at him by the time I got done with him. <laughs> um, I thought it was interesting the way you ended things with Gypsy's Kiss. Yeah. Can you talk about uh, why you chose to end the series that way? I um, I was trying to figure out a way to end it. Um, there was a story I wrote for Boeing Detective a few years ago called, um, I think, Roofies. And there was um, a character named Gypsy who was a stripper and was working as a call girl. And she uh, she was one of the, based on, um, part of it was based on Elaine from the Scudder series where she just kind of, okay, this is what I do for a living. I'm going to use this to kind of build something and get out of that life. And so that's what Gypsy started to do. She was kind of grateful to Nick for getting her off of heroin. And it's like, okay, I got the second chance. I'm kind of stuck with this. I'm going to get out of it. So she would always do favors for Nick whenever she needed it. And I was like, a little bit of tension there as well. I thought, now how, you know, how believable is it that this tall girl is going to fall for this detective? And I thought, wait a minute, you know, they saved each other's lives over and over again. That's going to kind of push them together a little bit. Um, and, he, and besides, I think I'd taken Nick and Elaine as far as I could. Um, I tried a couple other stories with Nick and Elaine, and they just kind of fell apart. So that I wanted Elaine to kind of have a midlife crisis as well, and that would kind of get Elaine to a good place. But uh, Nick, I kind of had to take him out of the whole action at the end. I was like, okay, you're going to go off with this beautiful woman and be in your happy place for a little bit um, until you tell me something really bad's happened. And then I'm going to start torturing you again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it seems like your books are very hard-boiled rather than noir. Would you agree? I would agree. I would agree. Because you did end up sort of with that happy, upbeat sort of ending, which I liked. Um, what crime authors have influenced you the most? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry? What uh, crime writers have I'm influenced you? I'm sorry, what did you say? What crime writers have influenced you the most? Well, it's, um, I think the first scenes were sung when I read Parker as a teenager, uh, Robert B. Parker. Uh, and at that point in time, most of his work was that, his first ten novels, which were incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, he just basically took uh, what was a tired type of story, tired subgenre, and just completely reinvented it. Um, on the downside, all of a sudden, it seemed like from like 1980 on, everybody had to have like a psycho sidekick, and yeah. part of my genesis was of that was okay. Parker did the psycho sidekick because nobody was doing it. Now everybody wants to do it. I'm gonna go the other way and go. Okay, you got a suburban dad cop who looked like Bill Cosby before he wrecked his reputation, or uh, um, you know the uh, dopey former operative who uh, probably spends his time out in the suburbs in a trailer, maybe uh, indulging in a little herbal recreation. You know, <laughs> Eric Teasdale. But I mean, like, his 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 operatives were not, you know, you know it wasn't like Bubba Rutkowski from, you know, Dennis Lehane's novel where it's like, all right, I'll go do all the amoral stuff. You just go sit there and be noble. Uh, it's yeah. more like... Uh, you know, Elaine does things because Elaine does things for Nick because she doesn't like the people he deals with, and it's like, you know, this person could threaten my son and daughter. Um, and you got guys like Teasdale who just do things for Nick because Nick pays them. <laughs> and uh, some of the other ones are just doing it out of a sense of loyalty. You know, the ones that are cops, but there's no like 
Arnold Schwarzenegger type character to graft onto that. I never really liked that mm -hmm. that uh, motif. So you're not going to have, uh, say, uh, I'm trying to think of the name in the Easy Rollins books, a mouse to. Uh, uh, no, there's not a mouse, and besides, a mouse is one of a kind. <laughs> That's I so think. true. And so it's Walter Mosley, for that matter. That's uh, very true. Uh, I it's guess I met him in person one time. Very interesting guy. He is. He's very, very interesting. I love to listen to him talk. Um, well, let's talk sci-fi then. Um, okay. <laughs> since you've ended up, you've ended for now. For I'm now. hoping eternal that you will eventually return to the genre. <laughs> but for now, you've ended uh, your your run in crime fiction writing, and you've started writing sci-fi. Um, there are some really great sci-fi mysteries, actually. Have you ever thought about writing those? I thought about it, but, you know, when you think in those terms, you start, like, trying to force-fit tropes from one genre or another in there. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I said I was going to put uh, Holland Bay, the novel I've been working on, the last couple of years. I was going to put it on the shelf. One guy came out and uh, told me, well, you're writing sci-fi. Why don't you just set it in space? And I'm sitting there going, right, let's just take all the characters from The Wire and make them, you know, Starfleet officers and hand it over to J.J. Abrams and you probably just see David Simon pulling out whatever's left of his hair mm -hmm. <laughs> with that suggestion. <laughs> uh, you know, because the wire is Baltimore. Baltimore is the wire. That's all there is to it. And I said, did you, you know, you helped me, at, you know, look this novel over. Did you not notice that the city that I created for it is as much a character as Cleveland is in the Kepler novels or so on or L.A. and, and, and Chandler's work? And I think what it was is he's just kind of thinking now he's going to basically, like, delete the whole thing off my hard drive. And I was like, no, we're not going to do that. We'll, we'll, we just need to figure out what we're going to do with it later. And right now I need to concentrate on this. Well, good but, for you. Good yes. for you. Uh, what kind of sci-fi do you write? Since there are so many different types, you have more fantastic type sci-fi, more dystopian. Um, How would you describe your, your work? Uh, the, basis, the basics of it would be maybe space opera because you got people sipping around in their stellar space. Hmm. Um, I make it a little difficult for them because uh, the way they have to do it, they can't really communicate easily. So uh, the follow-up to the first one's free. There's one character that complains. Uh, um, somebody from off-world is talking to him and says, "Hey, did you hear about this?" And he goes, "We didn't even know that the you know we didn't even know that the governor of Mars was removed because he was an alcoholic or something like that." It was like something <laughs> that happened six months ago. Because you know, when you don't have the world at your fingertips like we do now, which is you know, you can pull anything up on the internet you want, uh, information travels slowly. And I remember when I was a kid, the urban legends were probably even more bizarre than they are now on Facebook. Because Facebook, they they're there for a day, and then somebody goes, "Oh, that's a bunch of bull," you know. Yeah. Or it gets you know, or somebody posts a Snopes.com link on it. Uh, we didn't have Snopes back then, so you heard all these stories about like the guy with the hook on, mm -hmm. you know, the guy with the hook hand and the couple, and you hear about, uh, oh, you know what they really put in, you know, like your hot dog or Coca Cola or whatever. Of course, it's all just something somebody paranoid made up, and it just kind of took root. So I take it that your uh, sci-fi work is going to start out as a series? It is. Uh, I took an unusual tact. Um, the first one's free. The original version was just from the alien's point of view. The main novel that all this is driving into takes place on this distant colony. It's kind of like my main pro tag was a, uh, for the novel was a uh, spoiled rich kid who said he was going to run away from home because they were going to send him to military school. And he's thinking, I'm going to go to this one world that's like, you know, running away to Paris, running away to New York, something like that, someplace exciting and rich. And instead he ends up in the interstellar equivalent of Illinois at the time of Lincoln, you know. It's like, 
oh, they still drive cars here. That's I I can't handle this. Hey, my 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 the the little the little smart thing embedded in my the palm of my hand doesn't work anymore. Why doesn't that happen? How am I supposed to live here? This is primitive. Oh you my know, goodness! I'm amazed they have running water. <laughs> Well, it sounds fascinating. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. So what I did was I started from, he gets stuck there and somebody invades the planet. And I thought, let's start from the alien's point of view and find out why they did this. It's like, you know, it's like starting out the first episode of Star Trek with the Klingons. Mm-hmm. And uh, that got merged into another novella that I wrote called The Marilynists. And so the way I had a lady named Stacy Robinson help me edit it, and we merged the two. And what it does is it goes back and forth between this alien governor of a prison planet, and he gets conned into first he gets he gets conned with a potato basically. And what it is is he's having trouble feeding his people because the planet is it's very earth like, but you wouldn't want to live there. And he hands him a potato and says, Here, this will grow in anything, and of course it does. And then mm-hmm. when that crop fa- eventually fails, he says, well, i got a better solution. He says, there's two planets, a rogue planets are giving my people trouble. Why don't you get together with your military and take them over? And of course, one of them is the planet that we end up seeing. Meanwhile, it goes back and forth between him and this government official within, you know, uh, humanity's realm of influence. And he's trying to put together three new colonies to feed his people because his planet uh, basically could have been designed by George R. R. Martin where they don't know when the seasons begin and end. Mm. And so it makes it very hard to grow food, makes it very hard to develop. And they also have like a lot of factions that fight amongst themselves. One of the factions is a cult to Marilyn Monroe. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it was, uh, my wife, my wife, is uh, a big fan of Marilyn Monroe's when I start working on this. I says, hey, honey, I'm going to write about a cult 500 years from now that has a, uh, uh, that worships Marilyn Monroe as a goddess, and she thought that was hysterical. That is. That's that's a unique concept. I like it. <laughs> it is. Um, well, we seem to be running out of time, but before we wrap up, can you just tell me in, like, less than a minute if you think that sci-fi and crime fiction share any traits? Because I think they do. I think they do too. I mean, they have their there's certain little I don't want to call them rules because rules are meant to be broken. But I think there's certain things that you expect from the stories. Um, done well, they're almost identical. Usually, the protags are either anti heroes or they're kind of the knight errant. Uh, Captain Kirk and Doctor Who are very much Philip Marlowe and Spencer. Um, yeah. If you want to be a little more thoughtful about it, there's things like the Forever War and that, and it has a lot in common with the 87th Precinct and The Wire, where people were just trying to get by a slice of life and a little bit of morality uh, thrown in for good measure. Okay. Well, Jim, uh, Tom, <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for being here today with me and having this chat. Thank so, you. Um, before we go, I will just remind you that... Um, The Crime Cafe Season season 1 Story Package will be available at crimecafe.net for 99 cents. And Jim, I believe your novella, uh, Gypsy's Kiss, is going to be part of that? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So um, I look forward to talking to you all in two weeks, and thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye.